going to be covering chapters 40, 42, and we are covering the child with respiratory dysfunction and cardiac dysfunction. Probably the two hardest chapters that you will see. Respiratory is quite hard and you're gonna see as I start explaining cardiac, it can be also very hard. Now, let me put up for you in your chat box, the, um, the cardiac match, respiratory cardiac um, matching. It is, I've already sent it to your canvas. You still have it, but just to be sure, if anybody doesn't, you will have it here in front of you. Let me just get that up for you. Now in your canvas, you have also all the answers too. So that, you know, I'm gonna give you one without, but you do have it, it's all there for you. And anybody who wants to go over any exams, um, even if you got, you know, a 90, I don't care. Some students wanna know what answer they got wrong. I am more than willing to do it. Please set up an appointment with me. Many students already have. So i um, trying to fit everybody together. I try to give about half hour per person. Um, to give you what you need. And I will go over it and make suggestions on how you can improve for the next exam. Because I know everybody, if you get a 90, you want a 92 or a 94, I get it. And if you get an 80, you want an 82 or 84, and that's okay. I will do every, everything I can to help you um, get the best grade that you possibly can. This week, there is a quiz three. It is on respiratory and cardiac, and you also have discussion question four. So those are two things that are due this week. So Hello, Professor. how are you today, Donna? I'm good, thank you. And you? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm awesome. feeling much better. So thank you so much. So let me start out with our PowerPoint. Now you're gonna see that, um, hold on. You know what, I didn't put it back to normal. Hold on. There are 60, quest, 60 slides and there are 55 um, Kahoot questions. So there's a lot of work today. Um, I got done right on time for the earlier class. So I am hoping to do the same thing for you. So we're starting out with respiratory. Um, first of all, respiratory infections, most of them are viruses. That's why you go to the pediatrician with your children and they don't give you antibiotics. Even when you say, but he's having a temperature of 104 and he's sick and look at this and that. Well, until it lasts over three days, they're going to assume it is a virus. After that, then they will try antibiotics. Now, if it's a pneumonia, you know, and they hear like the lobes, they hear some decreased sounds, that's when they'll start drawing antibiotics right away. Respiratory infections are the most common things that happen with children. They're all sorts of viral things. Now, one of the infections that uh, children get are something called RSV. For you and me, it's a common cold. But for infants who have a hard time just sucking, swallowing, and breathing, we know that any increased secretions there make it difficult to breathe. So RSV is a virus still. So we treat it Tylenol, Motrin, and liquids and clearing the airway and maybe saline aerosols, not even going into albuterol aerosols. Now, a normal healthy infant can usually tolerate RSV very easily with a suctioning and keeping their fevers down and keeping fluids in them. But if you are an infant who has a cardiac problem or has some other immunosuppressive problem going on, premature had a problem with you know, oxygenation at birth, just that little bit of secretions could really be difficult. So there is a vaccine called a Synergist vaccine that we do give for about five or six months. They call it the, the season. Um, up north, it would be like September, you know, early fall through spring. And we give it monthly. And it is a vaccine to prevent RSV because it's hard enough for an infant to suck, swallow and breathe. So. Um, we do give that to those children. You know, infants who are having trouble breathing, you'll see them breathing with their abdomens. You're going to see them retracting, supraclavicular. You're going to see their necks just pulling in and out. When they get really bad, 
you'll see their little mares just flaring in and out. And you'll hear a, uh, uh, which you call the grunt after each breath. Now, working in the emergency room, seeing an infant that's a little nasal flaring, abdominal breathing, I see retractions, and I can see them pulling really hard, you know, between their clavicles, and I hear that grunt. This is an infant I'm gonna bring right to the trauma room because this infant's just about to, to go down on me. And I know that they need immediate, immediate care. So infants, that's your respiratory things that you would see on them. Um, it could be due to RSV or many other things. Now, when we talk about children and we talk about how they get infections and how they tolerate it, it depends on what their body can handle. What do they have the defense again? against. Now, the first three months, they've got mom's antibodies, which usually really helps them. Plus, what are we doing? Two, four, six months, we're giving a lot of immunizations to uh, protect these children from these really difficult diseases. The children start getting sick around that three to six months age because mom's antibodies go down. So you don't have mom's, you know, um, system infection system, their immune system to help them. By the time they get to be toddlers, and you know what toddlers and preschoolers do, you put them in daycare, you put them in preschool, what do they do? They play with toys, what do they do with them? Sensorial motor in the mouth, they swap spit as I call it, and they're taking their germs and spreading them from child to child. Now you'd say, well, that's bad, but you know what they're doing? They're actually building their immune system by sharing all of these viral infections that all of these children have. So by the time they get to be into school, it's more of the bacterial infections that you'll see because they go through all of these processes of getting all these viral illnesses when they're younger. Now, ear infections, why do they get them? Well, their airways are small, they're very short distances, and these tubes are big and wide open. So the mucus sits, they don't really blow their nose as well. So where does it go? Up into the ears. And that's why you get a lot of ear infections on these children. Now, what is an infant, child, toddler, preschooler gonna look like? Well, these children, of course, it depends with their age, but you're gonna see children when they have a fever, they're gonna stop eating. They're not like adults. Adults gonna eat and do what they need to do because they have to do it, but children don't. They're gonna stop, they're gonna lay down. And you're like, well, what's wrong with that kid? He's laying down, you know, sleeping and it's not nap time and kid don't like naps, et cetera, et cetera. Usually it's due to a fever. When we treat the fever, fever goes down, the kid feels a little better. So what do they do? They drink fluids. It's all mucus and upper airway, which is usually upper respiratory. These children, it's going to loosen it up. They're able to get rid of it. and They're going to feel better quicker. But children, they're going to start with a fever. They're going to stop eating. They might vomit because of the mucus that they're having there. And, you know, you're going to hear all that upper airway and all the mucus going on with them. And again, treat the fever and they're going to be up and running around again for you. So what is our goal? So you have a child who's sick and they're having an upper respiratory infection. Well, we want them to breathe easier. We want them to oxygenate better. That helps them rest and they're more comfortable, especially if we keep that fever down. We want them not to spread the infection, but you know what children do, they, they spread it. It's just part of what they do. I mean, they are learned you know, now to put their face in an elbow, but you know, they don't always. Keep them hydrated. And we do that by again, keeping that temperature down and of course, they need big hugs when they don't feel better. So ear infections, like I said, is because of this mucus sitting there and it's very short little tubes and it goes up in there. How do we treat ear infections? Well, remember ear infections hurt, they're painful. So they're gonna get Tylenol and Motrin. Don't forget to give them something for pain. Fever or not, they need something for pain, it hurts. Even warm packs sometimes can help these children. I know that, um, They'll put it on and off and on and off, and it does help. Um, don't forget that. Also, it is an infection. They will be getting antibiotics. Now, a child who's having chronic, chronic ear infections three, four, five times a year, 
This is a child probably is gonna be sent to ENT for evaluation to have tubes put in. And that tube keeps that mucus from building up in there and causing all that pain and causing that infection. So as a nurse, take care of the pain, educate the parent to finish all their antibiotics and heat and cold. And sometimes just telling them to sit elevated when they sleep so they don't pull their ears back and it doesn't hurt and be able to sleep also and the parent can sleep. Now infectious mononucleosis, we've all heard it's the kissing disease and we don't really think much of it, but let me explain a little bit more about it. Infectious mononucleosis usually presents as a sore throat, fever, body aches and pain, um, and it, all the lymph nodes could be swollen and feel horrible. Now, what you would see is initially, okay, let's do a strep test, it's negative, flu test, negative, okay, viral, treat it with Tylenol, Motrin, plenty of fluids. Five days later, they're still sick. They go see the doctor again, or maybe go to urgent care, they get antibiotics. Not working still, sore throat, fever, headache. They feel horrible, they can't move. Finally, they'll go to an urgent care ER. When we hear the history of a sore throat, fever, and feeling this body aches and pain, we're gonna think it's been going on this far. It was a virus, okay, now they gave antibiotics, still not working, everything is negative, Let's go ahead and draw some labs. And what we'll do is a CBC and something called a monospot test. Monospot test at this point will come back positive with infectious mononucleosis. It's still virus, okay? You don't need antibiotics. Antibiotics probably cause abdominal pain and vomiting anyway. So get them off of that. The Tylenol and Motrin, plenty of fluids, and the big thing is rest. Now, in mononucleosis, the liver and the spleen, either one or the other or both swells. And the nursing care, what we need to really be uh, emphasized to these parents and the child is that for at least three weeks, no PE in school, actually they should be more on rest, okay? And no rough housing with brothers and sisters or anybody at home because if you touch that abdomen too hard, the spleen could burst. Let me give you a real story. Little nine-year-old boy came in with the same history that I just said with his father on a Saturday morning. I was the nurse. And we explained, make sure that you take care of that belly. You have to get released from the pediatrician for him to go back on PE and to school. But for right now, he can't protect the belly. Very important, et cetera, et cetera. One week later, I'm the primary trauma nurse on call. We get a call, trauma's coming in. I went and there's this boy who was on a three-wheeler out in the Everglades, fell off onto his abdomen, his spleen burst and he died. Mononucleosis is not something very simple. Teaching the parent to be careful with that abdomen is number one, okay? Tylenol, Motrin, fluid, rest, no three-wheeler one week later. You must be cleared from the pediatrician, okay? Real story. And it really upset me. Croup. Croup is what we hear of that barking cough. It's an inflammation of the airway. It is um, some varying degrees of respiratory distress from a cough all the way up to an epiglottitis, because that's upper airway. Now, what is an epiglottis? That is that leaf-like structure, which covers the trachea when you swallow, so food doesn't get into your lungs when you're eating. Now, the epiglottis swells up and covers the trachea, and you can't breathe. These children, usually you will see them hunched forward, you will see them drooling because they can't swallow and you're gonna hear inspiratory strider. They can't get air in at all. It's a true and real medical emergency. How do we treat this? Well, it's an inflammation. How do you treat inflammation? First of all, nothing by mouth and don't you look inside that mouth because you can make it look worse. Only the physician looks inside. Only a person who can intubate or perform a trach 
can look in that mouth because all you're doing is creating more inflammation in there or causing more you know, trauma. This kid, as I said, you're gonna see them complaining of the throat, leaning forward. They're getting hypoxic, they're getting restless, they're getting scared, you know, and drooling. I mean, drooling is the big, big thing. We're gonna give them racemic epi aerosols. We're gonna give them um, some sort of steroids to decrease that swelling. Many of these children, if it doesn't help, we're gonna be prepared to intubate or do a tracheostomy. Now, if that epiglottis is that swollen covering the trach, can we get a tube down there? Probably not, it's gonna be a tracheostomy. Now, one of the more milder ones is the laryngotracheobronchitis. It's a croup, the viral thing where there's an inflammation in the airway and you are going to hear a bark, a bark. This child's gonna be barking like a seal usually due to a virus. Again, how do we treat this one? Well, number one, until we determine how their airway is, nothing by mouth, we are going to be given a steroid, some sort of steroid, whether an IM Decadron or a pill or some maybe prednisolone orally and send them home on that and that will help them. So what are you going to see? Well, this is a kid who's had a cold, who now can hardly breathe inwards and you're gonna hear the bark, 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 bark. We know that if this is not treated and the swelling continues and the bark and the irritation goes on, it can lead to respiratory failure. It's a simple sort of thing, but it can lead to respiratory failure in the end. So how do we take care of airway? Simple, maintain the airway, make sure it's open. If it's gonna be prolonged, maintain the hydration. If the kid's epiglottitis, I'm not giving that kid, that kid nothing to eat, but we're gonna start the IV because we're gonna give IV steroids there. We're gonna put on this mask with moisture, it's called a nebulized mist and oxygen just to help to breathe easier. Because remember, we give oxygen just for them to maintain their saturations and it helps them breathe easier. Again, nebulized treatments, racemic epi, and we're gonna be given steroids, whether IV, IM, PO, depending on severity of child. Now, as I said, RSV is usually during those winter, spring times. RSV, we have a test for it, just like we have influenza. And it's in young, young children, it's that extra secretion that really bothers them. So how do we treat these children? Well. If the kid is not too bad, we can still maintain oral, giving them a bottle. But if they're really, you know, um, having a hard time breathing, which the flaring, the grunting, the retractions, the, the um, between their little clavicles here, you're gonna see them pulling like crazy. That kid's gonna have an IV and we're gonna let the kid rest. We're gonna give maybe just saline aerosols. It's a virus and let the child rest. We're gonna clear the airway, suction the, the mucus, not over suction because too much, you know, makes secretion. So just enough. If we're gonna give them by mouth, we're gonna clear out the airway and just let them drink. Then we have pneumonias. And what are you gonna see in a pneumonia? Well, usually these children present with fever, between 101, 102, that's what I've always seen for pneumonia, you're gonna see them um, not wanting to eat and maybe vomit once. And that's usually all you'll see. Listen to the breath sounds and you're gonna see a lobe or multiple lobes which are decreased. How do we diagnose? Well, we'll do an X-ray. We'll see the decreased lobe. Usually these are a bacterial. They'll be placed on antibiotics, um, keep the fever down and um, to give fluids, to, to thin out the secretions. And most of them, as I said, are bacterial. Sometimes they get to the point of mycoplasma and that just means they need double antibiotics. We need negative, we need positive um, germs that we need to kill and that will work. Most pneumonias is just a single antibiotic, but when it gets to be the continuation and it doesn't get better, they'll go and they'll do both. And we know today there is a pneumococcal vaccine we can get because that's the worst of all pneumonias to get. Then we have something called whooping cough that was eradicated because of 
immunizations, but not every single parent believes in immunization. So there was an outbreak a couple of years back in the county where I live and the county above us. And this is an extremely contagious disease. And it is all about airway. And um, these children um, do really poorly. They um, need a lot of airway, they need oxygen, they need pulmonary toileting, they need um, very close monitoring uh, nursing care. Because it's so infectious, they need to be on an isolation called reverse, which means their air in their room has to be recycled. It can't come out into the population because the pertussis germ will get out and could spread to the whole hospital. So it, it's very, very dangerous. There is a vaccine for it, but as I said, it's when they don't. Then we have the foreign body aspiration. You see this picture? This is a quarter in a child's throat. I'm telling you, they usually swallow the quarter, not the nickel, not the dime, not the penny, which is smaller. I don't know why they always go for the quarter, put it in their mouth and it goes down. They usually come in, it hurts, you know, to be there stuck and usually in their esophagus. Um, most of the time they're breathing, but they're not swallowing, they're drooling, sort of leaning forward too. When they do that, Years ago, they used to take them to the OR, do a bronchoscopy, take little clippers, go down and pull it out. But that requires OR, IV, overnight care, sedation, etc. Today, what do we do? We put a Foley catheter down, blow up the balloon, have them sitting on the surgeon's lap, lean forward, and they pull it out, the balloon out, poof, and it comes out and they vomit and it goes onto the floor. And I'm saying, oh, it's my quarter, I saw it first. And then the kid goes, nope, it's mine, and sort of take him away from the idea that he just had a full catheter ripped out of his throat and the quarters on the floor. They're watched through the while, make sure their airway's fine, and they go home the same day. And they actually do very, very well with it. They swallow everything. They put um, in their ears, their nose, backs of earrings, crayons. I've seen cockroaches in ears. I've seen... Um, uh, beans, red beans, black beans, green beans, green peas, up the nose, all sorts of things. And again, they sort of do the same thing. In the ear, they take little clips and pull them, but up the nose, there's a thin little thing with a balloon. They put it up, balloon up, and they pull it down, and it comes out very easily. Usually, they've been to their pediatrician, it's shoved up so far that it, it takes a little bit. These poor kids have had this nose and pulling and they're scared by the time they get to us, but we can remove all of those things. And again, when it's done, making sure that you know their airway is okay. I have seen French fries get lodged in the trachea and I've actually seen bad outcomes from that. Three-year-old French fry went in, they tried to do Heimlich, didn't come out, um, came to the ER under rescue and he ended up being placed on something called ECMO, which is a machine that takes blood out, oxygenates, put it back in, and the kid actually died for a French fry. So being careful with foods in young children, again, very important. Aspiration pneumonia can be due to feeding problems or it could be due to environmental things like my good old Johnson & Johnson baby powder. You know, that powder in the air can really hurt the lungs. But even like Clorox in the bathroom when you're cleaning it and the child breathes it. I mean, as adults, we feel it and it hurts our lungs and it hurts the kids. But the other thing with aspiration pneumonia is like reflux. Kids will, if they're not burped properly or not sit up after feeds, you know, or overfed can cause um, that reflux, which can cause aspiration pneumonia, which will require antibiotics and will require good close monitoring. There's something called acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it could be done to many different reasons. Now, I live in South Florida and there's a lot of water and pools around me and, and it's used almost 12 months a year, maybe two, three months and not as much, but that's nine months of water. And many children like to go in their pool and they jump in and they drown. Now, by the time sometimes rescue gets there, 
parents or somebody, the neighbor, it's revived him and the kid's running around the pool. And you say, oh, good, the kid is fine. No, it could be up to 72 hours later that this kid goes into acute respiratory distress syndrome where the lungs start tightening up and they stop oxygenating. So Very drowning. It's a near drowning, yes. These children will be transported to the emergency room and will be admitted in a monitored area for three days because it's three days later they could have you know, acute respiratory distress and if they're home, they'll die. So they have to be placed in the hospital. But the kid's running around, he looks fine. It's okay, the, the lungs have been injured. The other way it can be injured is due to infections or it could be traumas, pneumothoraxes, the older children, drug um, overdoses, and as I said, your drownings. So acute respiratory distress syndromes, you've got very damaged lungs. This is an extremely ill child. This kid is going to be intubated, paralyzed, sedated, getting antibiotics. Sometimes it's a one nurse to one patient deal because they're so sick. Their mortality rates are very, very high. So these children, um, we try to prevent that as much as possible. Asthma, I think, is one of the most common respiratory illnesses in children. And it's basically a hyper-responsiveness of the bronchi. It's usually due to some sort of allergen that creates irritation and causes the lungs to swell and the air can't get in. So you can get air in, but it's hard to get out. So you have prolonged expiratory phase on these children. You will see them push to get air out and the end of pushing it, you might hear a <laughs> because it's hard. So asthma, When we figure out this kid is having asthma, the first thing we do is give a rescue inhaler, albuterol, provental, whatever your name is. And that's your rescue. Now, be careful when you're giving these, or the parent says, they took four hits of that thing and it didn't work. Well, how old is the child? And can the child push it down, inhale at the same time? There's adults who can't do it. so. Did they have a spacer? Now, what is a spacer? You see those little cup things on the bottom, the orange, the pink, and the blue, that's the spacer. You put it in the bottom, you put the mask around their face, you give the dose one, two pushes, whatever it is, and they inhale four or five times and they've gotten their medicine. So if a child, parents saying that they took four hits and it didn't work, well, make sure they got the medicine. Sometimes it'll prevent a hospitalization because when you put the spacer on, they're getting the medicine and you know something, it works. So very important question. Once we know their asthma, figuring out what their lungs are, doing pulmonary function tests, there is an end expiratory um, peak monitor, which monitors, take it home, and parents can use it to monitor children's volume of air moving. And you take it and you know what, when they're healthy, what the volume is moving. Now, if you see them getting sick, getting a cold, you'll take another measurement. If you have seen the air decreasing, this saying you're getting close to asthma. So increase giving the rescue to keep the lungs open so that you can prevent an exasperation of it. The goal with these children is to keep them normal as possible, letting them know that that peak end expiratory monitor, that meter thing, monitoring that, making sure they're doing well, making sure they're doing their aerosols, um, the preventative, which are the long-term medicines. In children, we use something called Pulmacort. And Pulmacort is like Simbacort, Brio for adults, twice a day, a little bit of a steroid and it prevents, it's preventative, it has nothing to do with taking care of, I can't breathe, it prevents it. The rescue is your albuterol, your provental, okay? Then we also, when you start not feeling well, we can start already with steroids, the corticosteroids. And we know that there's also that, um, the leukotriene, the uh, Singular. 
Singular is a pill that's even used in younger children now. And it's like a Claritin, but it's for asthma and preventative. So we do all this preventative, we monitor our children, they should be as normal as possible. But if we've done allergy testing and they're allergic to grass, they shouldn't be playing out in the grass. I mean, they shouldn't be playing soccer. Maybe tennis is a better choice or swimming or bowling or something else that's not rolling around in the grass. So there's other stuff to do with respiratory, but you're going to see that in the cahoots as we keep going, because there's other things like cystic fibrosis, we'll get there. Now, cardiac dysfunction, very hard to understand, okay? Remember children, what we will look at is not like adults. I know a med surge too, you're covering cardiac and you're going to see the only almost similarity is congestive heart failure, okay? But these are congenital heart defects. Children are born with the heart just not right. So they're congenital. Now, children can get the acquired diseases like adults because of infection, usually viral, which causes viral myocarditis. You know, the big heart gets big and floppy and don't work well. It could be due to things like uh, lupus, autoimmune, right? Or it could be due to the environment, you know, what's in the air. And also um, it could be due to hereditary familiar. Now, what I want you to do and make sure that you look at is following a trace of blood around the heart. So let's look at this little picture here. I want you to know the left side of the heart has higher pressure than the right. Well, let's look why. The left ventricle pushes hard. It's that motor of the heart. It pushes blood around. So the flow out of there is higher than the right side because the right, it just gets back. So the left side pushes it out and then it just gets back to the right side, okay? So pressure in the right side is less than the left side. Now I'm gonna do something here. I'm gonna show you something. So we have a heart. We have lungs and we have the aorta coming off the body, okay? So we have, this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart. So what happens? I'm gonna show you about looking at the heart like it is a hose, a garden hose. What if we have a kink here and that's all the amount that we can get through there? That left ventricle is pumping really hard, isn't it? Where's the blood going to go? It can't go down because it's so narrow. So instead of going down, it's going to come back. So it goes back into the left ventricle. It goes back in the left atrium and it goes back into the lungs and fills it up because it's a space to have it. What are you going to see? This is going to be congestive heart failure looking due to a kink in the aorta, and that's called a co-arctation of the aorta. Okay, interesting diagnosis. You're gonna see questions on this. So if I cannot get blood down, my BP is gonna be lower on the bottom extremity. Blood can't get there. So my blood pressure is not gonna be there. I'm not going to have pulses or very weak pulses. Blood can't get there, right? Because it comes back up. And remember, there's these little branches off the aorta up top. It's going to go into the head. And what are you going to see? In older children, that blood is flowing up to the head. You're going to get headaches. You're going to get a nosebleed. Also, you're going to have elevated BPs in this child. Does that make sense? Do you understand the garden O's? This kinked in the aorta, it has to go backwards. It can't go forward. Backwards goes where? Back to where it came from. And where's the fill up space? We're gonna fill up the lungs. And now you're gonna see a kid short of breath, dysmic, abdominal breathing, and you're gonna see their O2 saturations dropping, okay? So that is this one. So sometimes we see decreased pulses at birth. And I've actually caught one 
before I even knew what a coarctation was. I'm like, this guy doesn't have pulses in the lower extremities. When I first started the newborn ICU area, uh, before I even did cardiac. And I said, there's no pulses and it's actually poor capillary refill. And when they went and looked, the kid was a coarctation. Now, many of these children have a little bit of pulses and they'll go home. And these children will be a couple months old where they're having shortness of breath, tachypnea, um, failure to thrive, they can't eat, they activity intolerance, they're not doing well. Furthermore, not getting nutrition, cognitive delays, that's developmental delays, right? So I actually had a little girl who was three months old who had coarctation of the aorta, who was admitted into the cardiac ICU at Nicholas Children's. It was a coarctation of the aorta and she was in severe congestive heart failure because no one caught it earlier because cardiac is difficult to diagnose and many emergency rooms and physicians don't know it very well. So what do you see? Well, sometimes you're gonna see a kid, you're gonna see that they're purplish, cyanotic, that's good. Um, you're gonna see them not being at a weight they should be. I mean, if the kid's three months old, they're born at seven pounds and they're only eight pounds now, that's failure to thrive. They should have a couple more pounds on them. Because remember, they double their weight by six months normally. If they don't have that energy, they're not going to eat because they tire easily. Also, sometimes with coarctation and this going on, you might feel their chest. You might even feel extra murmurs and stuff going on there. Um, and this is what you'll see. And then as they get older, um, not, you'll never see a newborn with clubbing of fingers, but you'll see the older ones and I'll show you a picture. Another thing you might see is you'll look at the monitor and you know, newborns are 140 to 160 heart rate, right? But you might see 180. Why? They're full of fluid. The heart's trying hard to oxygenate. Your O2 sats are low because all of this fluid's in there. And if you look at the way that they're breathing, you're, and listen to the chest, you're going to hear that they're consolidated, they're full of fluid and rails. So you can tell by just looking and listening to these children what's going on. Also, coarctation, you're going to feel no pulses or minimal in the lower extremities. Blood pressures are going to be different, and it could be 20 um, different, 20 millimeters of mercury. So it could be 90 over 60 on upper, and it could be 40 over 20 on the bottom. It could be that severe, but at least 20 points different. And again, your heart's going to be faster trying to work. So when you suspect, what is the first thing? Well, it's the EKG, 12 lead. Then you're going to do an echocardiogram, and you're going to look around, see what's happening. When you find that there's an issue with an echocardiogram, prepare those, that family for a cardiac catheterization. This is when they're gonna do a cardiac cath. They're going to put big catheters into the right groin through the artery, femoral artery and vein, and they're gonna be shooting dyes and looking at what's the structural function of the heart, what's happening there. And that's diagnostic. We do do interventionals. Um, one of the things that Nicholas Children did many years ago, one of the first in the world was something called a helix device, where they took this little two mesh thing, which went through the um, septal defect and it closed each side without doing surgery. So it was a little device that went up and opened and it covered so that blood wasn't going through the atrium or the ventricle. It could be the atrial septal or a ventricular septal defect. Um, so that would be interventional. And then there's what we call electrophysiology studies. And that is when you're usually an older child and having periods of usually uh, SVT, which is tachydysrhythmia, it's normal heart rate that speeds up quick and slows down. And all that means is the right atrium of the heart has an SA node, which initiates a beat. When another piece of the, the right vent atrium decides to beat, 
that heart rate is actually higher. It could be, you know, 180 to 240. That's what an atrial beat is. So all of a sudden it clicks. And there's like, just try and say, hey, I want to do the BSA no work here. And it makes the heart rate fast. So they, the child gets dizzy and can feel that beating in their chest. Well, the EP studies, the electrophysiology studies, finds out which little piece of that atrium is making that stuff and they zap it and say, you stop doing that, let the SA no do its work. So there's different sort of cardiac cast. Now, you're preparing your child to go to a cardiac cast. Now, you have a positive, you know, um, echocardiogram, something's going on, they need to go to a cardiac cast. Well, older children, prepare them what's going to happen. They're going to start an IV, they'll be put to sleep, they will not get out of bed for the first 24 hours. They need to keep their legs straight, not bend it. There's going to be a pressure dressing on their groin where they inserted these catheters or maybe even a sandbag there. They can raise their head of their bed a little bit, but they're not out of bed. They'll be using a bedpan or they'll have a diaper on for 24 hours um, so that that clot doesn't pop. And the nurse will be checking vital signs and looking at that dressing. Now, I think post-operatively post or post-procedure of cardiac cath, number one, I'm gonna check that dressing. If you think about the size of a femoral artery on an infant, and if the clot dislodged in that movement between getting them off the table and cardiac cath onto their bed, and then wheeling them back to me, that clot could have dislodged. I want to make sure there's no bleeding going on there. Number one, what if there is? You're to take your fingers and put it above closer to the heart. So let's say here is where the insertion site was. And up here is the heart. I'm going to a little bit above, push hard. And I'm going to call for help. That is the treatment, but you're going to get a physician in there too, to monitor, to see how much blood had you know, came out, et cetera, et cetera. They can bleed their whole body really, really quick because that hole is huge. We're also going to be taking vital signs once that dressing is clear and it's, you know, no blood. Um, we're also going to be checking pulses. And it's important that we let the next nurse know what the pulses felt like because they can be a little bit decreased. They can eat, they can drink normally, but again, not out of bed for 24 hours. And we check blood glucose levels because they can be elevated or decreased. That's what children do with stress. Congestive heart disease, you know, I didn't realize how many children had it until I worked in the cardiac ICU. Um, I was there for 10 years, my most favorite of all my jobs. Um, absolutely love the cardiac kid. They really make me think. Um, most common cause of death after prematurity is congenital heart defects. Um, some of these hearts, if you could see, you know, the way their hearts are and barely moving, you'd be um, amazed that these children, you know, come through this. Um, their little infants are the most resilient of all humans as, as far as I'm concerned. Most common is the VSD. And Down's children have a lot of congenital heart defects. When we have a child born with Down's, we're going to be doing echo, making sure that they're not having a, some sort of uh, congenital heart defect. So we have two sorts of congenital heart defects. One that doesn't have good oxygen and one that has good oxygen. So acyanotic means even though there's a heart defect, you still have saturations of 100. And then you have one cyanotic. The biggest one of all is called hypoplastic left heart, which is a big, thick muscle of the left ventricle, only a small little area, and the muscle doesn't pump. So it is, uh, can't move oxygen around. So that is your biggest of all cyanotic heart defects. Thank God it is not the most common. Most common is Tetralogy of Fallot, and we're going to go into that. Now, remember, I told you about pressures that the left side has more pressure than the right. If you think about it, the left flows out, got four veins coming from the pulmonary um, from your lungs into the left atrium. There's actually four veins, so good flows coming there. 
And then we have the left ventricle pumping. So there's big flow. The right side gets it just coming back from the pump of the heart. So it's lower flow. So there is acyanotic, cyanotic hearts. Increased pulmonary blood flow. Well, if we have a heart, the right side is less flow, okay, than the left. So the left's a big flow, right is smaller. If we had a hole between the septums, whether atrial or ventricular, we know it goes from high flow to low flow. It's least resistance. It'll just push to the other side. What happens? Well, if it's an atrial or septal or, or ventricular septal defect, the left side is going to push blood into the right side and it's going to go back and it increases pulmonary blood flow because it's recirculating because of the way it shunts. The shunt goes left to right, left to right. There's another thing called a patent ductus arteriosus. Here we go. Another picture for you. So we have a heart. We have lungs, we have pulmonary artery going out. This is here. And then we have the aorta coming here. Now, you've heard about fetal circulation, right? How do we connect oxygenated and non-oxygenated? There's something called a PDA, which connects and it's there at birth and it's kept open by the infant's own prostaglandins, it's a hormone that keeps this tube open, which keeps oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. It, it keeps blood flowing around, making sure the body gets oxygen. After birth, within 21 days, it closes. Sometimes it doesn't. Many times it's with your premature infants. When it needs to close, because you don't need it open, we can do something to do that medically, a medicine. It's called endomethacin. It's given IV, it's given in up to three doses and it will close that without surgery most of the time. If it doesn't, we can put a clip on it and close it. Now, what if you have something where your pulmonary artery and your aorta are switched on the wrong sides, which means you have oxygenated blood going in a circle here and unoxygenated here and they're not mixing. We can keep this open and we will give synthetic, what the baby already has, prostaglandins. You need to know the names of both of these medicines. So endomethacin will close it when you don't need it. And prostaglandins will keep it open. This is called a patent ductus arteriosus, PDA. Patent ductus arteriosus. And this is vital in a child with transposition of the great arteries. That means the aorta is on the right side and the pulmonics on the left side, and you're not getting oxygen to the body, okay? something you need to look at again and again to understand. And if you don't understand it, please ask me to explain it again. So increased pulmonary blood flow are those things, atrial septal, ventricular septal, and that patent ductus arteriosus, PDA, all of them, more blood flows going on. Now, when you have obstructions coming out, we know anything with a stenosis means a narrowing. Aortic stenosis means it's narrow. Pulmonic stenosis is narrow. So it's hard to get up there, just like the coarctation, right? Those are obstructions. When you see atresia, like pul decreased pulmonary blood flow, tricuspid atresia, that is the valve between the right atrium and right ventricle. There's nothing, there's no opening. Well, what goes from the left ventricle? It goes up into the lungs, right? So you're not getting blood to the lungs. So that's an atresia, no connection between the right atrium, right ventricle. Transposition again is when they're switched and we need prostaglandins to keep it open. And then the other one I've mentioned is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So 
go back, look at these again. If you don't understand, please get with me and I'll help you. There's some information here regarding them. You can look at those too. So now we have a congestive heart failure. Could be due to a weak heart or it could be due to aortic stenosis. It could be due to um, your um, coarctation of the aorta. Blood can't go, so it goes backwards and it fills the lungs up. What are you going to see with these children? Well, I think you can see this kid is retracting. You see his chest pulling down. The abdomen's gonna go probably between their, their uh, clavicles, supraclavicular retractions, very specific to children, nasal flaring, you could see grunting. You listen to their chest and it's going to be full of rails and you're gonna hear the fluid in there like crazy. When we have congestive heart failure, and we don't treat it, that heart's going to try to beat really fast. It's going to really, really try. And if we let it go too much, it's going to really stress and really damage that ventricle and end up usually with transplant. So congestive failure is like this x-ray. It's full of fluids. You cannot um, breathe well. You can't feed well. Um, what are you going to see with an infant? Well, in an infant with congestive heart failure, what are things that we are going to look at to try to prevent it? Well, if we start seeing our child starting to breathe a little faster, heart rate going up, why? I mean, is it due to temperature or is it due to failure? We're also going to see fluid retention, which means decreased urine output. Now, how do we measure urine output in infants? Well, if I have a diaper, usually the infant's newborn's is size one. Size one diapers weigh 30 grams dry. If you take it off the infant and it weighs 60 grams, that is 30 mLs of fluid. So it's grams per mL, very easy to measure. Very important measuring I and O on uh, children with congenital heart defects to make sure. Also, what else do we do? Strict dyno and daily weights. We're gonna see those weights coming up too quickly. And we can say, all right, you're gaining weight. You know, we're, we're starting to see urine output going down. We can give a dose of um, furosemide before it becomes a congestive failure or medicine to help that heart beat. Um, make it beat more effectively. Something called Primacor, Milnorone is something we give them. But that improves cardiac function. No fluid, it's not pumping against anything and oxygen is getting where they want. So get rid of the extra fluid, make sure that heart's not overworking and keep oxygenation. Put some oxygen on that child. I mean, oxyhood is, oh my goodness, one of the nicest thing on these infants, this clear plastic thing. We can give 40, 50% on that. They still can have their hands in their mouth. They still can have a pacifier. They don't have that thing in their nose because they really don't like a nasal cannula. It can be used for sure, but the oxyhood is actually the nicest for these kids. So again, how do we take a congestor heart failure? We want to do everything to make that heart is beating against less resistance, keeping that fluid down, monitoring output, monitoring daily weights. Um, we are going to be looking at their vital signs, seeing where the heart rate is and their blood pressures are. We are going to still keep nutrition in these. These children can get, because they're congestive heart failure, they're going to tire easily. So a tube feeding, whether an NG tube, an OG tube, we're going to do those things to help that child. And of course, they can have their little sucker. They can non-nutritive sucking, you know, because it doesn't take extra effort. Um, and these parents need to be supported so well. I mean, when these children are so sick, I will just have them brush their hair. I will have them help me change diapers, you know, rub lotion on them, do things that can help them, the parents, especially mom to bond with these children. Now, as I said, some of these diagnoses and congenital heart defect are due to cyanosis, you know, cyanotic defects. What does the body do when you don't have enough oxygen in it? It says, you know, it's probably due to you need some more red blood cells because, you know, red blood cells carry oxygen. Well, that causes an increase in hemoglobin hematocrit called polycythemia. 
Polycythemia is due to low oxygen and the body saying, I'm going to produce cells to try to help. So your hemoglobin hematocrit is normally eh, 14 and 42. It could be 18 and 54 easily on a child with a cyanotic heart disease condition. It really could be. Of course, you're going to see, you know, the O2 sat's lower for sure. You're going to see some bluing. And as the kid gets older, like this hand here as an older child, you'll see the clubbing of the fingers on a child with a cyanotic heart defect, like hypoplastic heart syndrome, left hypoplastic heart syndrome. So this child is a lifelong child. This is a child that's going to need family taking care of them for life, many of them. So these, some of them didn't even know they had a cardiac condition before they started. So make sure that they're understanding what's going on. Teach everything you can for them. Have them involved in the care as much as you can. Explain why you're measuring diapers, giving a daily weight, why you're doing stuff so that when they get home, they can look out for the same things. These children will be going to cardiac cast, echo, doctor's appointments, on medications. These families need really good support from the nurses. And it is the nurses who get them prepared to go home. From admission, we are teaching these children and parents to go home. Bacterial endocarditis, just like adults. An infection of the lining of the endocardium and of course, prophylaxis before any procedures, whether it's a cardiac cath or dental or whatever, you're gonna do uh, prophylaxis. Now in pediatrics, there are two diseases, which um, two things that can occur due to a strep pharyngitis that was not treated. Strep pharyngitis, and you think strep throat, hmm, not a big deal. Well. These parents need to be taught, don't share the antibiotics with the other child that has strep two. You need two bottles of it, okay? And make sure you finish it to the end because an undertreated strep pharyngitis can turn into rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. These children present with a sore throat. Their nodules and their fingers and hands will be swollen. They could have a fine rash on them and they feel horrible. Sometimes they get to the point of chorea where, you know, their gait is shuffling and they're falling. And sometimes with the joint problems and this falling due to the chorea, sends them to the doctor. And what are they going to ask? Has your child had a sore throat recently? And most likely it will be. How do we treat rheumatic fever? Well, it's due to a strep infection. They're going to be on a long-term antibiotic some antibiotic. It could be amoxicillin. It could be 30 days of it. They'll be putting them on there till we get it. And the chorea will, will disappear. The, the mental of, you know, the gait will, will go away and all of the other problems if treated in time. If not, rheumatic fever can cause permanent valve damage and usually the mitral valve, which will need replacement as they get older. Professor Bogart. Sure. Uh, with the fever, I mean, with the sore throat, how long does that normally last? Is it up to two weeks? Usually you will see the um, symptoms from rheumatic fever start within two, three weeks after the initial pharyngitis. Thank you. You're welcome. Children can get high cholesterol. You know, it's things that we're learning as we, you know, progress in, in the medical field. I mean, we never looked at that when I first started nursing, but, you know, at the end, yeah, they are. Another thing, um, they can have cardiac dysrhythmas, slow, fast, or they can have PVCs, PACs, just like adults. And the medicines we use are the same as adults, but in pediatric doses milligrams per kilogram per dose, micrograms per kilogram per minute, same thing, but in uh, pediatric dosages. I've seen pacemakers in children less than two years old for Brady dysrhythmias also. And then the tachy dysrhythmias, usually that's when they do those EP studies and they zap it, try to get rid of it when the medications don't work. 
pulmonary artery hypertension is usually due to some problem where the lungs are damaged and they go into spasm and they don't want oxygen and carbon dioxide to, to pass through. Um, these children are always short of breath because they don't oxygenate well. I've seen young children with pumps um, on where they needed a continuous infusion of medicine to help keep their lungs open. And they're basically waiting for transplant, basically. Lung, du uh, double lung transplants. Another thing is cardiomyopathy. As I said, it could be due to infection, usually viral, believe it or not. Um, could be uh, familiar, it could be due to some metabolic, it could be lupus killing the heart, right? Could be any of those things that can cause it. And usually the child, when they get these big hearts, they end up with a heart transplant. And heart transplants can work well. You know, I've had several of my children, hypoplastic left heart syndromes. Um, in fact, my little Thomas is now going to be 18 years old this year. And he was eight years old when he got his transplant. And he got it on Valentine's Day. He told his mom, tomorrow's heart day. I'm getting my heart. And he was, let me tell you, this close. He needed a heart quick and he got it. And this kid has lived an amazing life. Um, I had another little girl, Olivia, who was uh, 22 um, who when the first heart started to fail, she went for a second and it didn't take and she ended up dying. But, you know, these children, you get so emotionally attached and involved. When Olivia died, her mother sent me the most beautiful thing to let me know and how that how I took care of her always stuck in her mind and how she told all the nurses about me and how I took care of her little Olivia. Olivia was my little special, special people. And, and in the cardiac program, you have children who come in and out all the time. You know, Christopher was my daughter's age, went to school with my daughter and um, he ended up um, dying. But every year on um, Nurses Week, I will get a message from his mother to Chris's most favorite nurse, don't ever change, we will always love you. So you can make a huge difference. Christopher only listened to me, would never had surgery unless I was there. It was such a connection that you do build. Olivia, I, was give, I gave her her first bottle. I, I, I could tell you stories, uh, stuff that touched these parents and myself for life. So transplants can work. They're, they're not forever, but you can give a child more than they ever would have had before. They all lived good lives. And today we're checking for hypertension a lot earlier. Many years ago, we didn't check young children's blood pressures. We did, you know, temperature, pulse, respiration, maybe saturations, but today we're checking it and we're finding younger children, I think age two up now, we check all blood pressures to try to rule it out quick because what does hypertension cause? It causes problems with the heart, it causes problems with the kidney. So we need to check it quick. And then there's Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is a systemic vasculitis, which means an inflammation of vessels. But what we're most concerned about is the coronary artery and causing aneurysms. This is also one of those hard cases to determine what is going on. These children have a viral infection that lingers and lingers and lingers. You're gonna see this kid with um, this rash, not the big marked one like rheumatic fever, but this fine sort of rash. You're gonna see the fingers start peeling um, maybe blistering the palms of the hands, soles of the feet. And do you see that red eye? They glow in the dark. They're so red. Um, it's what you see. Strawberry tongue, cracked lips. Um, these children um, come in and finally when we determine their Kawasaki disease, we will do this treatment. And the treatment is a month long. And we'll give intravenous immunoglobins. It's a viral disease now. And we will also give them aspirin. 
the only time we give aspirin. So why do we give aspirin? It's a vascular itis, inflammation of vessels. It prevents clots. And because it's an NSAID, it decreases inflammation. So treatment, month long, aspirin to decrease clots and to decrease inflammation and IVIG to, bo to boost the immune system. So Kawasaki, um, the one thing that we will be checking, usually if they come in today, by tomorrow, we're already doing an echocardiogram. Why? We want to look at those coronary arteries to make sure that they're not involved. And then we have shock. What do you see with shock? Well, high heart rate, low blood pressure, and it could be due to many reasons, whether it's due to anaphylaxis, septic, or you know, the baby just gave up, whatever it is, but there is shock. And what you see is again, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, high heart rate, and this child needs to be supported, usually ventilated respiratory and um, given usually antibiotics and vasopressors to help the child come through. So here's a question about that PDA. Surgical closure of that PDA. Remember PDA, it's a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It keeps oxygenated blood going to the body, okay? So when you close the ductus arteriosus, what would you see? Anybody? C. Well, you are taking oxygenated blood from the aorta, it's going pressure back to the lungs. So it D prevents, D, prevents the return of oxygenated blood. Yeah, it's a hard one. PDA is something hard to understand, uh, but I want you as you're reading going on to look at it carefully. And if you're not getting it again, just let me know and I'll help you through it. So who wants to win the cahoots today? Albert, you ready today? Oh, oh, he's ready. Larissa, maybe. Okay. Jennifer's going to do it. Yeah, I know. Here we go. Oh, no. we're getting there. And we should be done right on time. Because I know you guys are exhausted. And this was only my second class today. Bella Booyah, okay. <laughs> All right, it's going so we get out on time. Respiratory cardiac systems, it's a big week for y'all. A majority of upper respiratory infections are caused by what? I mean, you take your kid to the doctor and he's all of this mucus and coughing and the fevers are 104. And, you know, you walk out of the room and he tells you, it's a virus. Give him Tylenol, Motrin and lots of fluid. And you're like, but the kid is 104 fever. Usually virus has big fevers, more than bacterial, believe it or not. And Jen started first. A multi-select. What would you suspect if a child has a dry, bothersome cough that keeps them awake at night? Something actually we didn't discuss. So there's only one that we didn't discuss. 
So asthma is not at night, could be any time of the day or night. Croup, you know, you, you think maybe, but actually it's that bronchitis, it's after upper respiratory infection, it's this dry cough that actually we treat with um, a cough suppressant, a coating, which helps the cough um, calm down. Claudia went up top. The preventive immunization for RSV is which one? Remember, it is given during usually the fall and up to spring. Uh, once a month, we usually give it for those children who are more at risk, premature, cardiac, um, et cetera, because sucking, swallowing, and breathing is rough. So synergist. It's also called palzifumab. Um, Humira is for RA, indocin, indomethacin, this to close your PDA. And hip is hepatitis. You give that at birth before they go home usually. All of the following are signs of early respiratory distress in children, except what is late. So tachycardia is the beginning, diaphoresis because you're having a hard time breathing and struggling, restless, hypoxemia, bradycardia, they're about to code. You see an infant, a small child, bradycardic, who is in respiratory distress, get the crash cart because they're going to code for sure. And Bellamy went up top. A four-year-old child's been taking meds for asthma. They're still wheezing. What information is important to ask this mother or father? So is that squirt going into the air or is it really going into the lungs? So remember, how are they taking it and is it effective? There are young kids who can do that. I mean, even for me, it's hard. So that spacer is a great thing. An eight month old with croup exhibits what signs and symptoms of respiratory distress? Croup. Remember croup is an inflammation of the larynx and the trachea and the bronchus. It's a lot of inspiratory distress here and it's retractions and restlessness. Remember, it gets to the point of respiratory collapse. So substernal retractions and restlessness. Um, abdominal breathing, pulse of 140, uh, you're, that's part of it. But the big thing is the stress, retractions and restlessness. They're getting hypoxic. That shows more signs of respiratory distress. Signs and symptoms of asthma include all except. <clears throat> Remember, you can get air in, but you can't get air out. It's a prolonged expiratory phase. And it starts with cough, a dry <clears throat> cough. It's an irritation. Remember that airway, it's all getting inflamed. It's hard to get air in there. It's a cough, 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 short of breath, wheezing. And it's prolonged expiratory phase. And now Mishi's up top. Signs and symptoms of congenital heart disease include all except. Well, think about a congenital heart disease. I've told you that blood goes in all different directions and the heart has to work really hard at trying to oxygenate the body. You know, the heart will speed up and slow down according to the needs. Now, that working of the heart burns calories. So usually congenital heart defect children, you need to give extra calories in their formula 
because they're not gaining weight, because they're burning more calories, just beating their heart and breathing. Good job. What should you not do to children diagnosed with croup and epiglottitis? Do not look in that mouth unless you are prepared to intubate or start a trach. That is absolutely the golden rule, especially epiglottitis. You see drooling, bending over, problems, inspiratory strider, you know what's going on. You know, get that racemic epi. Say, ah, I'm getting a racemic epi and get in there and get the doc. The epiglottis is what? So the epiglottis is that leaf-like cartilage that prevents choking and it covers the larynx when you're swallowing so you don't aspirate. Now Jen is on fire, good job. Multi-select. When doing an admission on an infant with a low-grade fever and loose cough, what information is important? What do I need to care for this kid now? So I need to know what fevers. I wanna know immunization status. And absolutely, if they're having a fever, I wanna know when the last dose was given and what was given so I can keep that fever down. Cause we know children, infants, doesn't matter. Fever's down, they're gonna eat better and get those fluids in they need, especially with upper respiratory. Cystic fibrosis, what is it? Now, this is one thing I didn't cover in the PowerPoint. Cystic fibrosis is inherited from children, from the parents to the child, to, to the child um, mostly males uh, instead of females. And what it is, is the body's inability to digest foods. And there's a buildup of mucus, which goes into the lungs and digestive tract. Now, what do we do for cystic fibrosis? Well, we, of course, if it's in the lungs and there's clogged and mucus, we want to keep those lungs clear. So intense chest physical therapy Deep breathing, coughing, walking, ambulating. The thing where they pound their breathing. Down. That that thing they've got those vests now that just go like this, or those big round things. That, I mean, there's all different things that they use to get those lungs moving. And also, for the digestion, you use high calories because they don't gain weight as well as other kids. Absolutely, because they don't digest all the food. And they're gonna be getting something called pancreatase, an enzyme to help them digest. You give it with meals, exactly when you're feeding them. And sometimes if they can't take these capsules, you put it on the food, okay? But make sure you rinse the mouth out when they're done. And the one thing with any meds, when you talk about children, as a child gets older, they need bigger doses. So making sure that you're not on an infant dose when they're three years old, making sure it goes up. Very they important. also have another medicine now that helps with the uh, fluid. I forgot what it's called. My niece has CF. Oh, she does. Yeah. That she... might be good for your, your project. I'm in between her and my daughter. I really am. Like Whatever you want. They're both good. Good job, Ariel. Thank you. And Arissa's on fire. What is the greatest risk for an infant having a cardiac catheterization? Again, always worry about that hemorrhage from the catheter site for sure. How is cystic fibrosis identified? I mean, sometimes you know that there's a familiar history, so you know to test for it. Sometimes it's 
constipation at birth, no stools in the first couple of days after birth, and they're gonna be looking for cystic fibrosis. It's one of the telltale signs. <clears throat> the one thing I'll tell you to do is, uh, if you lick the infant, you're gonna taste salt. I'm not telling you ever to lick, lick somebody else's infant, but if you did, all you do is taste salt. So you're not gonna restrict salt in these children because they lose it, okay? But it's called a sweat test and it's usually done at an infant when suspected or when they're showing signs of it, as in constipation. If an infant doesn't stool in 24, 36 hours, there's a problem. Multi-select. What is included in the plan of care for the child with cystic fibrosis? We are going to, of course, do that chest good, those enzymes and high protein. You will be giving salt. You do not have to restrict salt. They're losing it enough. So um, they can have salt in their meals. What is a drug of choice for pharmacological closure of that patent ductus arteriosus? Remember I said you can close it medically and it's you give three doses and we can do surgical if it stays open. You know, PDAs that are open, you're gonna hear this murmur. Once it's closed, the murmur goes away and it's indomethacin and again, three doses. And if you ever work in newborn ICU, there's a whole protocol watching BUN and creatinins before and after and time in between doses, et cetera, et cetera. And when do you know that closed? It's when that murmur, you stop, you stop hearing it. The other thing is blood pressure. It could be 60 over 15, which is a normal blood pressure for a newborn. That wide pulse pressure goes back to 60, 40, where it should be. That's another thing that you see in PDAs. Wide pulse pressure, it's called. Which is not a feature of Tetralogy of Fallot. Tetralogy is all right side. Tetralogy is when a flap of skin goes over the pulmonary artery and closes it. So there's no flow going from right ventricle to the lungs. I have seen a child with tetralogy go from O2 sets of 100 to 10 in 15 seconds. They go from pink to black that instantly. Tetralogy of flow, how do you treat this? Well, you take in an infant, go knee to chest. I had a little boy, Nathan, who did this at three o'clock one morning. He went into a tet spell, knee chest, boom. And what that does is you have the pressure in your chest and your abdomen. And when you push it in this knee chest, it changes pressure and it releases the flap. What's well, pretty neat, there are some older children that if they feel this tet spells on, they will just squat to the floor. You know, they'll take, sit on their, you know, knees and they'll go right to the floor. And again, what does it do? It changes the pressure between the abdomen and the chest. Tetralogy of Fallot is a diagnosis you are going to see on your NCLEX, guaranteed. It's all right-sided. It is pulmonary stenosis. It is right ventricular hypertrophy. It is a opening between the ventricles, a VSD. And then there's something called an overriding aorta. The aorta sort of pushes over a little bit, but it's all right-sided. So aortic is left side. Good job. What medication would you hold for an infant that is vomiting? And the vital signs are 98, 88, 32. Cardiac infant, they're vomiting. What could be that problem? What could cause that? Remember, infants can't talk to you. They can't tell you other things. They can't tell you, I'm seeing yellow halos or I'm nauseous. It could be a child cardiac placed on digoxin, which is normal. Remember, pediatric dose, they do take it. And they're very young when they start. This could be a week old. 
but the only thing you might see is vomiting. So you see a kid is vomiting, is on digoxin, you're gonna hold it and get a digoxin level. But this one also had a heart rate low. So that was your telltale sign there. Now Ari's on fire. Why would a child with tetralogy of flow not gain weight at the normal rate? You think tetralogy, think tet spell. What is tet spell? A hypoxic moment, right? That's how you think these questions. So it's that inadequate oxygenation leads to decreased energy and they do not want to eat. Some children have multiple tet spells. Some children only have one or two, but it does decrease oxygenation. And without that, they are weak and tired and they don't eat well. All are examples of cyanotic heart murmurs, except which one? It's not truncus, so don't do that one. Okay, tetralogy cyanotic. I said 100 sats to 10, right? Tricuspid atresia. Atresia is no opening. Where is tricuspid valve? Between the right atrium and right ventricle, right? Can blood get from the right ventricle up the pulmonary artery? No, there's no opening. Definitely cyanotic. Aortic stenosis is a narrowing. It still puts blood out. It has nothing to do with cyanosis. So your answer here, the cyanotic does not, is aortic. It still oxygenates the body. Blood's still getting out there, still oxygenated. What is the most common con cyanotic congenital heart defect? What have we been talking about the most with cyanosis? And it's tetralogy. PDA is not cyanosis. That actually increases oxygenation, okay? And a hypoplastic left heart is a cyanotic heart defect, but thank God it's not common. Remember, these children are three-stage surgeries, multiple cardiac calves, echoes, doctor's visits, and usually end up in a transplant. So the most common is the tet, tetralogy of Fallot. Nursing care following a cardiac catheterization. Again, check that insertion site number one making sure it's not bleeding because that's your most scary point at that uh, on return. Nursing education for cardiac catheterization include all except. You are not going to bend that extremity. You're not going to put it on a pillow. You leave the extremity alone. Why? We don't want to dislodge the clot and cause bleeding. We're going to do vital signs. We absolutely need an allergy history and a pressure dressing on infants and then with a pressure bag on older children. Usually they're five pounds they put on there to prevent bleeding. Which information is the most important when rheumatic fever is suspected? <clears throat> Remember, rheumatic fever is due to an under or not treated strep throat infection. What is the care? What are we going to do to treat it? We are going to be giving at least a month long treatment of antibiotics. Signs and symptoms, rheumatic fever. That kid comes in, 
joint pains with the chorea, maybe falling over, sore throat, just not feeling good. Um, and then the last, when did your child have a sore throat or upper respiratory um, lately? And it will be that pharyngitis. There's one more diagnosis that also we'll see as we get to week eight, it has to do with strep throat infections. Signs of shock in children include all of the following except So shock, I've told you, it's elevated heart rate, decreased blood pressure, and of course, there's a lack of oxygen, so altered mental status, and poor capillary refill because your heart's not working effectively. Hypertension, absolutely not. It's opposite. Hypotension. What is the treatment for Kawasaki disease? Systemic vasculitis. Inflammation of the vasculature, the vessels. Most concerned about coronary arteries. How are we going to check that? We're going to do an echo. Aspirin to prevent clots, IVIG for the immune system because it is a viral uh, problem. It's caused by a virus. Which of the following best describes the pathophysiology of Kawasaki disease? Multi-system vasculitis that may affect the coronary arteries. Yes, and our biggest concern is the aneurysm of the coronary arteries. So we're going to do an echo. We're going to check on that. Multi-select. A clinical manifestation of Kawasaki disease is what? What do you see? You're going to see everything but erythema margiteum. That is the rheumatic fever. It's the erythema margiteum. It's a difference, a big demarcation rash. Kawasaki is a fine little rash, okay? But the hands, the feet, the tongue, the eyes, the lips, absolutely. Like usually it's that blistered or cracked hands and feet that will clue us into, hmm, maybe Kawasaki. Why is an echocardiogram needed for the patient with Kawasaki disease? Because we want to make sure the coronary arteries are not with an aneurysm. It hasn't anything to do with congenital heart disease. Kawasaki is a perfectly normal heart. We're just worried about the vasculature or the coronary arteries that they have an aneurysm. Once we cure this, we give the IVIG. It's a month long with aspirin. These children do not have relapse. They do very well. Jessica's on fire now. Which of the following is the most common cause of shock in infant and children? Septic shock infection, infection for sure. Um, Children, if we don't get ahead of the infection, especially those that are immunosuppressed or already in, you know, having issues, the infection that can cause shock in children. Jen knew that one. What are the defects associated with tetralogy of Fallot?
Remember, tetralogy is all right sided. Your pulmonary artery stenosis, the VSD, that overriding or misplaced aorta. And because the blood can't go up into the lungs, that right ventricle stretches, which is called hypertrophy when it stretches, because the blood has to go somewhere. So it goes backwards, garden hose again. A young child with tetralogy of Fallot may assume which position naturally when having a tet spell, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, what would they do? And they just squat, they just squat on the floor. It's like they, they're standing up and they go down and their knees hit their ankles and their knees are up and it's a squat and it's that abdominal and chest cavities and it changes the pressure which causes it the flap that's on that pulmonary artery to go up and they can oxygenate. Transposition of great arteries is what? What does that mean? Transposition, what does that mean? That means something is switched, right? What are the great arteries of the heart? We have a pulmonary artery and we have an aorta. That's all it can be, okay? So they're switched. So if the aorta is coming off the right side, it's going to the body. So oxygenated blood keeps going to the body. The pulmonary artery is coming off the left side. So we keep flowing blood into the oxygen, into the, um, to the lungs. They're not mixing. What do we need to keep this child alive? The PDA to make sure that the aorta and the pulmonary artery have a connection and we can oxygenate that child. They do really well. They do so well that we can actually feed these children bottles couple like for at least a week we can do a very planned surgery not an emergency surgery and these children do really well and once it's corrected these kids are perfect which of the following is not an intervention indicated for transposition of the great arteries Remember, those things are on the wrong side. Our goal in that is because we're not mixing blood, oxygen and non-oxygen, we need to mix it. And how do we mix it? Well, we're gonna give prostaglandins to keep the PDA open, to have the mix. There's a patent foramen ovale between the atrium at birth. We will put a catheter with a balloon and pull it through and make it bigger. So right and left side now have communication. And the surgery for this is called an arterial switch operation. We switch the arteries on one from the other and it literally pick it up, turn around and put it down is exactly what they do. Oral nothing is gonna help these children. It's keeping them on prostaglandins making sure we're mixing blood and then doing the surgery. And Michi's on fire still. Multi-select. Why is prostaglandins given to a child with transposition of the great arteries? What is prostaglandins? What does it do? I'm telling you it's natural at birth, but then it goes away. <clears throat> And it makes sure that the child is oxygenated because there's no connection. The, the aorta is going on unoxygenated. And then the lungs, the pulmonary artery is, you know, going back to the lungs. There's no mix. So it helps with oxygenation and it gets the output so that the whole body gets oxygen. Endocarditis, this is not an antibiotic. It is a um, hormone that keeps the patent ductus arteriosus open and it has nothing to do with antibiotics at all, nothing. 
What is the purpose of giving indomethacin to a neonate where they patent ductus arteriosus? What does indomethacin do? If you look at a PDA, there's two things. There's prostaglandins and there's indomethacin. One does one thing, one does the other. So indomethacin stops that prostaglandin in that PDA from being formed and what happens, it closes. Because usually a PDA will close by itself within usually 21 days, the max that it can keep it open. If we need it closed earlier or if it's open later than that, we can close it by giving doses of indomethacin, a medicine. If that don't work, we can always do surgery. Where is the patent ductus arteriosus? What does it connect? Patent ductus arteriosus is like fetal circulation. It connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So it can lend the aorta oxygenation or it can have the aorta is giving, it goes back into the lungs again. So the PDA is used for what? It is used to oxygenate a child who can't by themselves. The biggest um, congenital heart defect it's used for is transposition of the great arteries because there's no oxygenation going on. It gives you a connection. This heart defects allows blood to pass from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. What is it called? How about the left atrium to the right atrium? What is that called? It's called a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. So if there's an opening, there's a septum in between, okay? So it's either a ventricular septal defect or between the atrium, it's an atrial septal defect, okay? Got to get used to these terminologies. You will see them again. A multi-select. What is the sign of ditch toxicity in infants? What do you know this infant is? So we don't know if they see yellow spots. Can an infant tell you there's yellow spots around the eyes? An adult could, but not an infant. You will see ditch toxicity, that nausea, retching, vomiting. You'll see absolutely and a decreased heart rate. For sure, those things you will see. Yellow spots, they can't tell you. Oh, I've seen yellow spots to my eyes. I'm sorry, they can't talk yet. <laughs> Multi-select. Where can the blood flow when the PDA closes? Again, where is the PDA connected from? Patent ductus arteriosus, fetal circulation, connects the aorta to the pulmonary artery. When it's not there anymore, where does blood go? It goes back to the lungs and back to the body, period. I already knew that one. What is congestive heart failure? So when the heart can't beat good, congestion means it's gone up into the lungs and the lungs are full of fluid. What are you going to see? Tachypnea, tachycardia. Um, you're going to see some sort of hypoxemia. You're going to see weight gain, um, decreased urine output. All of these things you're going to see with congestive heart failure. And we can prevent it if we're looking for those things. Left-sided congestive heart failure causes what? The left side of the heart, if it's not working well, what are you gonna see? Remember garden hose. 
And that's shortness of breath, fluid in the lungs, coughing. Excellent. Good job. A multi select. Signs and symptoms of rheumatic fever include. And there's a pretty picture there with everything. Can you see it? And it's absolutely everything. You're going to see erythema marginaeum. Remember, that's rheumatic fever, not Kawasaki. Korea was that shuffling gait, which when treated with antibiotics will go away. It reverses. Those joints are going to be so swollen and nodules there, all part of it. How do we treat it? About a month long, at least, course of antibiotics to treat the strep infection. After a heart transplant, what is the lead, leading reason why children die? And it's rejection. Rejection is the biggest thing in uh, transplant. Make sure that they're on their immunosuppressants for life. A multi-select. A child is about to have a chest tube removed. What should you do? You know, post-cardiac surgery, they could have three, four, five different chest tubes in there. You know, and I'm telling you, chest tubes that have come out, it burns. And it burns for a good 30 seconds, a minute or more. So again, you explain it to their understanding. They should have an elevated head of bed because some of these chest tubes are in the lungs. So you want them to breathe. So that puts the diaphragm down. And number one biggest thing is medicate them before you do it because it hurts really bad. You're not going to put them flat. Absolutely not. You want them up so they can breathe easy. A child just had abdominal surgery and cannot cough well enough to expect rate secretions. What is your priority? I mean, we know postoperatively, we want, you know, any patient, adult, children, doesn't matter. We want them coughing, turning, deep breathing. We want to prevent, you know, atelectasis of the lungs. And, you know, if they're not doing that, what are you going to do? Number one, medicate them for pain. Once you medicate them for pain, have them up, sit them in the bed, send them for autonomy, cough, deep breathe, give them a pillow but give them something for pain. It hurts, whether it's abdominal, cardiac surgery, doesn't matter, it hurts. An infant of three months has a fever of 103.6. What would you medicate the infant with? Three months old, what do you give? <clears throat> and only Tylenol till six months old. After six months, you can introduce ibuprofen. There's something to do with platelet aggregation and the young infant. You cannot give Motrin ibuprofen till six months old. So the only pain reliever you have for an infant is acetaminophen, Tylenol till six months old. A newborn infant is assessed and you find very weak lower extremities. What should you assess next? What have you just learned about weak lower extremities? How do you validate that? So, you know, doc, I found that this infant had really weak extremities, so I did what? <clears throat> You did four extremity BPs. Remember, coarctation in the aorta, weak lower extremities, lower blood pressures on the bottom, and because the blood can't get down, blood's going up top, so you have higher blood pressures on the upper extremities, and there's a difference of 20 millimeters of mercury minimum. So four extremities BP. Heart sounds aren't gonna tell me nothing at this point because they're newborn.
They haven't gone into failure yet. Multi-select. A critically ill child is on complete bed rest. What can a nurse do to prevent complications? And it doesn't matter, an infant, a child, an adult, you know, on complete bed rest. Children can get the cubitus ulcers. They can get foot drop just like adults. So we're gonna protect their lungs. We're gonna use, as we turn them, because once you put a lung up top, you know, that lung will expand more and it moves secretions. And then you turn on the other side, turning them every two hours, not every six. Head of the bed up, they can breathe easier instead of spirometry if they can. And those pillows and blankets just get them so comfortable and they'll stay where they need to stay. And again, you're gonna use maybe a chucks to keep them dry or a diaper if you have it, you know, to keep the um, their area not full of urine or feces. What they select. How can oxygen be delivered that's easiest tolerated and accurately monitored for infants? I mean, I described one way that was absolutely the best, but there's two ways that are very, um, I like one over the other, but they're both easy tolerated and accurately monitored. Oxyhood is number one. Nasal cannula is number two. Blow by, you can't monitor. It's not monitored. You don't know how much they're actually getting. And easily tolerated an endotracheal tube. Children don't like an endotracheal tube, just like adults don't like an endotracheal tube. I've been intubated. It is not a nice thing. Feels horrible. A multi-select. What procedure are used to keep the lungs open with a child with cystic fibrosis? <laughs> Deep breathe, coughing, chest PT, so important exercise. And ambulating two, three times a day, not PRN. You need more than just so whenever they feel like it, as much as possible. And Mishi went back up top. A multi-select. Children with cystic fibrosis require pancreatic enzymes with meals. What teaching should be done? <laughs> So right before meals, you can sprinkle it, but make sure that they rinse their mouth. And again, having that dose change as they grow. So they're on the accurate dosage. What is the cardiac defect when there's no valve between the right atrium and right ventricle? I ask you, what's the name of the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle? And that is your answer. Tricuspid atresia has nothing to do with the only thing between them. It's like between the right, the left ventricle and the left atrium is the mitral valve. That's all it could be. And atresia means nothing. Stenosis means there's an opening. What is the greatest risk factor for a newborn receiving a cardiac calf? Again, it's the hemorrhage, absolutely the hemorrhage for sure. And last question. When an infant is breathing fast, tires easily and needs rest periods during feeding, what should you assess? What would give you the answers to why that infant looks like that? Breathing 
breathing fast, tires easy. All about breath sounds. Go to the breath sounds and listen to them. All right, let's see how we did. Number three, Ari, good job. Number two, Jen, and number one, Michi, number four, Jessica and Bellamy. Good job, guys. What I want you to do is sign your attendance attestations. Make sure that they get done so that you remember. Remember, if you want to go over your exams, I am more than willing. If you have any issues with today and want to know better, I'd like to know. Arielle, is it your birthday because you have a crown on? No, my hair is just a mess. So I'm trying to... Actually, it looked pretty good. I was going to tell you. It looks really <laughs> good and curly. Thank you. I always put a crown on my head when it's my birthday. That's why I asked. No, there's like this one part that just, like, if you look at it from the side, they won't I don't cooperate. See it. So I just was like... I don't see it. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Have a great day. I'll be posting that. I didn't post last week's uh, Kahoots. I'll be posting that. Okay. A little bit going on in my life. So I'll definitely get those out to you so that you have all of it. Okay. Thank okay. You so and this, much. quick question, Professor, the study guide is, um, it's going to be week six that's going to be posted out. Could it be posted out any earlier? I will be posting. I'm working on it right now. Okay. No, I'm not working. to rush you or anything. It's just that I have a leadership exam that same week. So I understand. I, like I, I get you. I understand <laughs> as soon as I can have it there and it's done accurately and, and the best for you, you guys will have it, but I am working on it right now. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Have a good evening, guys. You too. You're very welcome.